Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I could not be more delighted to have the pleasure of interviewing spiritual medium, teacher, mentor, and author, Marilyn Wall, whose client base stretches from her home in Sydney, Australia, to New Zealand, the United States, Singapore, India, and the United Kingdom. Marilyn is renowned for her accuracy, compassion, and insight. She has taught in the USA alongside celebrity mediums, appeared on TV, been featured in highly regarded magazines, appeared as a guest medium on In Spirit TV, demonstrated in America at the Journey Within Church, been interviewed by Spirit's Voice, an online community, and she is the author of the inspiring and uplifting Knowing a Medium's Journey about her unfolding from a shy and demure child into a brilliant light for the spirit world. I'm looking forward to talking with Marilyn about the loneliness, abuse, and despair she experienced during her childhood, the vision in her mind's eye of a woman holding her hand upward, and how that changed her life, her description of the spirit world, how we know if our choices are coming from fear or from love, what pets experience in the afterlife, and much more for an interview with an enlightened, remarkable woman who knows for sure that love is the key to healing, pain, and moving mountains. Hi, Marilyn. A truly heartfelt welcome to Grief and Rebirth podcast. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. It's, um, It's my pleasure to be here. It's just like, thank you. It's interesting listening to you introduce me, (laughs) you know, do we do all those things? Have we experienced all those wonderful things? It's just like, you know, here we are, same as you. You've got an incredible story um, that you're sharing with the world. So it's my pleasure. Thank you for being here. Thank you. We're birds of a feather or should we say maybe angel wings or something, but here we are. Birds of a feather. Birds of a flock <laughs> together. That one resonates. Right. <laughs> so let's start from the beginning and let's talk about your childhood. I mean, you had loneliness, abuse, despair. You knew you were different from other kids and you knew things that others could not know. You want to tell us a little bit about those developmental years? Oh, gosh. You know, Looking back now seems like a long time ago memory. (laughs) It's not here today. But when I wrote my first book, Knowing, I think that was really when I started to understand myself. I don't know whether I understood, like probably so many people, um, what was really going on in my life as a child growing up. Yeah, it it wasn't until I started to put my life on paper that it all sort of started to make sense. When you talk about loneliness, I mean, I was the youngest of six, had a stepfather, alcoholic stepfather. Oh, boy. Yeah, so looking back now, I could say very dysfunctional, very dysfunctional. There are a lot of things I didn't talk about in my first book that I probably feel ready to talk about now, more of what it was like growing up. It's taken that long for me to be able to put it on paper. Yeah, but like you know, that's probably the best way to heal self. Yeah, is to, you know. Beautiful. Well, I'm wondering, these yeah, childhood, look at so it. you had this difficult childhood, but 
I would imagine, and it, it's also informed me because I also had this difficult childhood of how it relates to the work you now do in your life, right? You feel like it, in a way it was preparation for a greater Absolutely. understanding. Everything. 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 I think everything that I've been through in my life has given me this opportunity to have more people come to me and for me to be more understanding of situations. Because I feel that if we haven't experienced something ourselves, we really truly don't have an understanding of, of what it's like. And no two experiences are the same. You know, no two experiences or no two people's life situations can be compared. Yeah, but for me, if, I've got to experience something to to actually understand it, to have that epiphany, to have that lightning bolt moment, to have that spiritual awakening, to to understand compassion, really. It comes back to compassion. I think all the things that I've experienced in my life yeah, have been for that greater understanding. I feel I feel likewise. And as far as in your childhood, you also had a knowing and abilities and things that made you different from others. And one was you had experiences with watches that continue to this day and explains how our concepts of time and space are different. And you can explain how our concepts of time and space are different on each side of the veil, which is very dear to my heart, Marilyn, because I have a problem with time, honestly, on this side. Everyone is very oriented towards, you know, you have to be somewhere at the dot of time of something. And I always say, well, maybe part of me is on the other side already because I'm not as focused on, there's no such thing as time there, right? So can you explain to everyone about your experiences and how the concept of time and space are different? So that uh, we can finally relax when we cross over. We're not going to be so pressured with time. The concept of time that humans have formed. Growing up as a young girl, we all got watches. There was four girls and two, two boys, and we all got watches one Christmas. But my watch always stopped or it went fast or it lost time. And I was always getting into trouble as a young girl. I was supposed to be home at a certain time. and my watch had either stopped or it had slowed down or, and I was never on time. I was always late. I was always in trouble. So, you know, there was even a time when I tried to figure out what the time was and put the watch on the right time of when I had to be home to show my mum so I wouldn't get into trouble, but it was never the right time. Yeah. And to this day, even if I'm out and people don't believe me, if I say to someone, well, give me a watch and I put it on for five minutes, it either stops or it just goes backwards. Yeah. Is that so a magnetic pull inside of you, do you think, or your natural your vibration, or, or what do you think that is? Maybe the spirit world just trying to get through to me that there's no need to worry about time. Like you, I just move through life, um, you know, planning. I don't know. There's a certain amount that we have to sort of plan and we need to, you know, turn up on time, you know, when you're, you know, you've got appointments and things. But yeah, other than that, just it doesn't rule my life. It doesn't rule my life. I've learned from those in the other world that there is no time in their world. There is no time in their world. And, you know, if you understand that concept or you've experienced it, the same is here. We're just really walking through space in our everyday life. And who wants to be ruled by time? Who wants to be ruled by time? Yeah, but then it comes back to, you know, being ruled by, you know, anything really. We can still turn up and be on time without the concept of time ruling us. So I don't know. I I I don't I don't know about, you know, the magnetic field. I mean, that's a that's another thing I'd probably have to sit with for a few minutes. But you probably have some kind of a strong vibration that turns off those watches. I'm just always in the other world, I think. There's no separation, you know, it's it's part of us. A lot of people think that the work that I do and, you know, being labelled a medium is, you know, that I've got five heads and ten arms or something. But, you know, it's just, it's no different to the next person. It's just part of us, you know, there's no separation. And I guess that's the best way that I can describe the the watch and the time. It's the spirit, the spirit world, those in the other world, life. It's just part of us. 
And if we're aware that, you know, this form is a form, we can go beyond that. We can go beyond that. So, you know, I'm never late. I'm always on time. You know, I've got no time for people that are late. So, you know, that's the irony of me not wearing a watch and me not really, you know, being ruled by time. I'm always on time. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, but I guided. I'm guided. It's almost like I've got a clock within me, you know, and I can read that clock and I can read that time inside me. I can see it. I don't need a, a clock on my arm. In you a know, way, that's better. So yeah, you absolutely. Know, you're, getting, you're, getting yeah. These, you're getting these heavenly nudges when you have to be somewhere. So, yeah. and I really love when I was learning about you that your personal, you went through all of this in your childhood. You went through, you know, you were confused. You knew you, were, you had these gifts, right? That, I mean, when you were a kid, were you able to see spirit already and all of that? I don't ever remember waking up to some of the stories my students have shared with me, you know, seeing hands floating around the room or spirits sitting on the end of the bed. I don't ever remember experiences like that. I've always had imaginary friends. I guess my, you know, my toys growing up, my stuffed animals, my dolls, whatever it may have been growing up, I guess they were my my friends. They were my communication. They were my life. I mean, they always answered me. You know, and that might have been where part of my loneliness or or walking alone might have come from because I never felt alone. You know, I probably just thought it was normal to, you know, have a conversation with a, a hippopotamus toy or something because it would communicate to me or with me. Yeah, and I always had a and a love of nature and I had a love of um animals and and so in that respect I was never alone. Um it was That's just to me. It sounds to me like you're being provided comfort behind the scenes. Absolutely, and yeah. And support. Being alone, but always knowing that you weren't alone. I, I always knew I never walked alone. I could walk down the street and I, I didn't feel alone. And it wasn't until a lot of years later um, that I probably even understood, you know, that there was a, a team of people walking with me from the other world. Yeah. That's marvelous. So something, though, drew you to go to this lifelong lifeline counseling service and begin to get into essential oils, especially rose essential oil, which began your personal healing journey, which brings you closer to where you are today. So could you tell us about that? I was a mum. I was a mum. I had two children. My gosh, I couldn't have wanted for anything in the material world. And there was an emptiness. Yeah, there was just an emptiness. Um, and I woke up one morning and just felt like I wasn't living the life that I came here to live. And that feeling, as you can imagine, I mean, it was pretty overwhelming. I mean, I had this life, I had a family, I had everything, everything and nothing, so to speak, because this emptiness was bigger than all of it. So I started just walking. I was just roaming the streets. I'd take my children to school and I'd just walk and walk and walk. And I ended up on the river edge one day, probably asking for help, not aware that I was asking for help at the time. And I looked across the road and I saw the sign lifeline. And I thought, wow. And I, the pull within was so strong. I crossed the road. I knocked on the door. The door opened. And I must have looked like I'd seen a ghost. I must have been in a really bad place because they invited me in. And it was a place where they didn't let people come in. They would answer the phones at this place. They didn't let people come in and sit down to talk to a counsellor. Uh, but they let me in. And when I talk about the door open, it's like the door open. It was like the door to my heart open that day as well. It was interesting. It was like I the whole journey began sitting in groups with um, other people, I think, trying to piece life together, understand life, you know, learning about meditation. I could talk about it for a week. Yeah, you know, finding out, you know, who, who I was, where I needed to go, understanding, you know, fear, understanding love, decisions we'd made. It was, it was a journey. It was a journey that took me into a lot of different arenas. Gosh, I spent time serving the, the homeless in that time, and that was so fulfilling. I spent time with my daughter at 
Christmas time, you know, sitting on a floor at one of the mission places and, you know, putting presents together that have been donated for families to come and collect. And that was very rewarding. That was one of the most rewarding things I got to experience. You know, it's like giving to others. Yeah, giving to others. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And you also got into essential oils, which were part of your healing also, right? You discovered I did. essential oils. I did. They became my best friend because, you know, they were always there. They were always there. But I just found them again, you know, it's like walking that path alone. You know, these little bottles of pure essential oils became my best friends. You know, the aroma was just delicious. Their properties were nurturing, you know, they were supporting. You know, the rose oil, gosh, I used to feel like I was wrapped up in all these beautiful colours and the softness. And neroli, I loved neroli. Neroli was like a little mum. It was probably like a little mum that I didn't have with me at this particular time when I was going through such a big change. Yeah, but they also helped me in a lot of other ways on my path. Um, they helped me. An opportunity came for me to present workshops selling them. I mean, I loved them so much that I was approached by one of the companies. I'd been working in a new age store and obviously I was selling a lot of pure essential oils. And they approached me at a time in my life when I was wanting to give up working in the new age store and they asked me if I'd present workshops for them. But that involved holding a microphone and standing up in front of an audience and having to speak. And that was one of my fears, one of my greatest fears. But at that time, um, the spirit world was coming a lot closer to me. And I knew I had to take a leap of faith in regards to doing the mediumship work that was still a little bit down the track. So first of all, I had to overcome the fear of public speaking. So there I was with the microphone selling these beautiful, pure essential oils, anything that we love, anything that we're passionate about. I think you can overcome, overcome anything, really. It yeah. sounds to me like you were being set up all this time. This was another way you were being prepared for what you were going to do, because there's a voice that came deep within you that told you to listen to your heart. And that began the journey that changed your life. So tell us about that. So now you're doing the presentations, you're saying with God, and all of a sudden you get this voice and it begins a journey and you become inspired to pursue mediumship as your calling. Tell us about that. Well, I did. I had this story where, you know, I guess as a single mum, I had to, you know, depend on myself financially and every other way. You know, I had to work, I had to pay my bills and there was an opportunity that came into my life where, you know, I was being totally supported to follow the pull from within. So out of the greatness of that, I just surrendered. Yeah, I just surrendered to all the stories that, you know, that were just embedded in me. And I gave everything up. I think it was probably back in 2003. I mean, I'd done a lot of seeking and searching prior to that, but I think it was 2003. And the energy that was coming in from those in the other world and to work with the other world was, was, was deepening. And I just gave everything up. I just surrendered. I was very nomadic. I felt like I was just roaming the streets trying to understand, you know, the spirit world. I'd find myself laying on my lounge room floor because the energy was so intense that I wasn't sure wow. what was going on. Wow. Yeah, but I just surrendered to it all. I joined a, a weekly group sitting with other like-minded people and, yeah, I just to get dedicated every minute of every day to serving the other world. Amazing. Now, in late 2008, you began to see a vision in your mind's eye, which really changed your life, of a woman holding her hand upward. So tell us what that sign indicated to you and the amazing thing that manifested in your life from that. And I also want to ask you about, after that, signs that people get from the other side and why butterflies have this special significance and meaning for you also. So Tell us about this whole, and literally speaking of butterflies, this whole transformation and unfolding that happened in your life. Well, I was married at the time when the vision started coming towards me, and it was quite a solid vision, and it was a woman with the hand standing up. And um, 
I remember saying to my husband at the time, my now ex-husband, I remember saying to him, I just keep having this vision and I was walking around the house going like this, you know, and he said, honey, sounds like the Statue of Liberty. And I said, New York. I said, well, that's where I'm going. And he just sort of looked at me. I guess he was used to me. And then I mentioned something to another medium friend and James Van Praag's name must have come up. And I, computers weren't my friend. But anyway, somehow I found James Van Praag's website. Don't ask me how. Obviously, those in the other world just mm-hmm. guide. They do. Yep. You know, if I try and think how I turned a computer on in those days, let alone found a, you know, a web link. But anyway, it happened. And here I was reading about this man, James Van Prague. But all I saw on his website that he was taking a class, all I saw was the NY New York. And I thought, that's it. That's where I'm going. Well, I put an application form in. I marked the time off in my diary. I didn't hear anything back from Rhinebeck in New York where he was teaching. And I just thought, well, that's it. Not going. Got it all wrong. And then I think the next day I woke up and there was an email and it had been summer holidays, I think, in America or something. And, you know, the campus, nobody had been there and they got back to me. And here I was, I was going. This was the Omega Institute. New York, the Omega right? Institute. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So then that brought up a whole lot of other things, Irene. You know, I had to face a lot of fear about getting on a plane, going somewhere I'd never been by myself. So I had all these fears to face. What was I going to do when I got there? How was I going to manage? And and my daughter looked at me and said, Mom, you've been talking about nothing other than this for months. It's just like, go. And I went. And it all just fell into place, you know, it, as it does. Like you know, meant to if, be. Like it was if, meant to be. Yeah, if you surrender and if you trust and you follow the pull from within. And there I was. Here I was in New York, upstate New York. And I'm sitting in James Van Prague's workshop. And I think the second day I heard Spirit's voice say to me that I would be the third person to go up on stage. And I'm sitting there having this conversation with myself thinking, yeah, right. There's 500 people in the room. And, you know, here I am being told by the spirit world that I'm going to go up on stage, you know. So anyway, two people have been up on stage to deliver messages. And James said, is there anyone else who'd like to come up? Well, I was catapulted out of my seat. Don't ask me. what Somebody, happened. somebody propelled you. <laughs> the spirit within was ignited and there was this force greater than myself. And here I was on stage standing next to James Van Praag delivering a message to the audience. Wow. And, that, and that's another story. So then after that, I think the next day, just briefly, I wandered into a class early because I had a question for James around some trance energy. And he said to me, come over here and we'll talk to this person over here. And he said, can you tell Marilyn what we were talking about last night? And James had been talking with this other lady about asking me and getting some people together to sit in a circle with the trance energy the night before. And I'd wandered into the class early the day asking him a trance question. So he told me to meet him at, you know, whatever, eight o'clock that night under the old oak tree. Again, here I was facing all my fears, standing there, bewildered, not knowing what was going on under this old oak tree, waiting for this man, James Van Praag, to turn up. Well, the door wasn't open to the room we wanted to sit in, Irene. Not many people know this story, but we did. We found a window that we managed to open, and we helped each other. And one of James us, helped each other through the window? Oh, my one goodness. Of us, one of us got through. Well, there was a few of us to get through the window so we could go and open the door to let the others in. Yeah, you know, it's like to make things happen sometimes, you know, you know, you just move beyond any obstacles that are there. Yeah. But also so, a wonderful bonding experience with you and James. Yes. And then I went back to Sydney and I wanted more of what I experienced with James. And I ended up on a cruise about six weeks later. I went to Rome. And here I was embarking on another journey, you know, this person who was fearful to go to New York, here I was flying around. James got wind that I was coming and he started to email me and he said, look, if you can get to the airport at such and such time, we land and we'll be there and you can come with us. 
Well, lo and behold, I found a plane that landed the same time that he was going to be at the airport. And here's this two two sort of strangers looking at each other at the terminal, <laughs> banging into each other. And, and that was oh. it. We were off on a journey. And one of the nights on the cruise, he said to me, what are you doing after this? I said, just going back home. He said, do you want to change your plans and travel with me? And he said, I'm going to the UK. You want to tour with me? Around what the a UK. compliment that he saw you the way he did with your gifts. Wow. So I got to travel with him and learn from him and sit in audiences, watch him work, Tony Stockwell and some other people. Wow. It was just incredible. Yeah, it was just incredible. But there were a lot of fears to face and there were a lot of tears along the way, you know, but just human things that you've got to push through that you never push through. But, hey, you know, you just get up to survive another day and, and go beyond because, really, that's all there is. That's all there is to experience while we're here, just to continually, you know, go beyond, you know, the limitations that hold us back. And then there's the story of the butterflies. When you talk about the butterflies, I did hear a voice um, from the spirit world loud and clear. Like, as a medium, we don't always hear, well, I don't, and a lot of other mediums, we don't always hear the spirit's voice like this, like you and I talking. But often, if there's a, you know, if we've been pre-warned, you know, we we do hear it. You know, we hear it like this, loud and clear. And I was at home in Sydney one day and I heard this voice say, your mum died today. And I wasn't speaking to my mum. I hadn't spoken to my mum. We'd had a little disagreement. You know, you look back and think just how how crazy all that is, you know, that we get so caught up in, in nothing. So I immediately picked up the phone. I had this whole overwhelming sense, you know, what if my mum did die? What if I hadn't spoken to her? You know, I get to work with people in the other world. I get to sit with people who didn't get to say goodbye. You know, I knew the importance of talking to my mum if I had that opportunity again. So I rang and my mum answered the phone. That caused me to try and think, well, hey, what were they trying to tell me? Was it a premonition? If my mum answered the phone and my mum wasn't dead today, what was what was that all about? And I, yeah. I got to understand that it was a premonition, no time in their world, you know, no time in their world. And I'm grateful that I heard that and I got, you know, another six to nine months to to visit my mum and spend time with my mum. That whole time of, of that happening, um, the number 11 became relevant. You know, you talk about signs. The number 11, I was getting on a plane at 11 o'clock. It was 11 degrees. We were landing at 11. It was all 11. Wow. Seated. Yeah, so I knew there was something to do with the number 11 as well in regards to a sign as to, you know, my mum. I was trying to figure it out, is there 11 days, is it the 11th month, is it the 11th hour? At that time, you know, I guess the messages weren't quite as clear. So, you know, I had a little bit of a gauge when I received a message, you know, was the number 11 the 11th month, was it the 11th hour, was it 11 minutes, so to speak, just for for your listeners. And, you know, when I shared these stories with my other brothers and sisters, I mean, everybody always thought I was crazy. You know, I was always like sheep. It was always different. You know, I was always losing my marbles or something. There she goes again, yes. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So there's just so much in between all of that. But when my mum did pass, I got a phone call and it was the first to the 11th. The first oh. to the 11th. It was 11 o'clock in Australia. And I jumped on a plane and there was a chance that she would have passed by the time I got to New Zealand. Well, she did. She passed when I was in the plane. But the interesting thing about that was I was trying to see what the time was in New Zealand because Australia and New Zealand are on different time zones. And I wanted to know the exact time of when my mum passed so that I could ask one of my sisters because, you know, I just wanted to know because so I had actually this, you were looking for validation of what you yeah, yeah, I had this yeah, I had this overwhelming um sense from the spirit world in the aeroplane of knowing my mum was passing. So that was when time was important to me. Um and as you say, validation. So Afterwards, when I landed in New Zealand, my mum had passed and my mum hadn't spoken for a couple of days, but one of my sisters said she called out my name before she went to the spirit world. And I just thought it was interesting that here I was suspended between the worlds, 
you know, doing the work that I do. Gosh, it brings tears to my eyes. And just the beauty of it all, of knowing, you know, that I'm between the worlds and my mum's passing, you know, she's between the worlds. It was like, here we are together, but in a different way. It was just beautiful. But when I left the hospital, my sister was very distraught and I got in her car and I said, I'll drive. And when I got in the car, I said to her, wow, what is it with these butterflies? Like her car, the visions for me, you know, I see things very clearly. And it was like her car was full of tinned butterfly. Oh. And she's like, she took my arm and she says, sis, what did you say? And she was crying and crying and crying. And then she told me the story. I wrote about it in my book, knowing how my mum, before she went to the other world, there was a couple of days where my mum was sitting trying to catch this pretend butterfly and she told my sister it was the most beautiful, you know, iridescent color. Um, so, yeah, you know, I have a butterfly on my website, on my book. And, and for me, butterflies are, you know, are knowing that my mum's around. I mean, it's not that my mum's a butterfly. You know, we get so caught up in the human world. We get into a denser place and we think those in the other world aren't with us. But the spirit world's told me, you know, they're omnipresent in our everyday life. They've told me that it's us who shifts our attention. Well, I had to Google omnipresent because I didn't even know what the word meant, let alone I could say it or spell it. So, I mean, I knew it didn't come from me. Yeah, so that's the significance of butterflies, you know, for me and in connection to my mum. Sometimes, you know, I might be feeling alone or I'm caught up in the human world and and I feel that she might not be with me. And as I talk about it now, it's almost like, you know, she sort of hits me over yeah. the head. I'm here, I'm here. Well, I'm I here. also, yeah, I'm here. I also feel butterflies represent transformation. And Absolutely. You, you had such a transformation. So I could really see that being your symbolic spiritual totem yeah. or whatever yeah. also. Yeah. And speaking of butterflies, I want to ask you, because you've got a well-known bumblebee reading that you talked about in your book can you share that uh, with everyone because now should... you're becoming a medium and you're doing all of this actually i have three questions for you i want to hear about your bumblebee reading and then whatever you can share with our listeners about the spirit world and i know you also talked in your book about what pets experience in the afterlife so could you tell us a little bit about all of that I remember doing one of my first ever readings in person and I'm sitting with this girl and I'm hearing Bumblebee and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, in those days I was probably a little bit in the way and I'm sitting there thinking, gosh, this girl's just paid me to come and have a session and for the moment all I feel I've got to give her is Bumblebee, Bumblebee, Bumblebee. I may have said to her, you know, that there was a man from the spirit world. I don't remember exactly, but I do remember the bumblebee. And this girl, when I said bumblebee, 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 she said to me, what did you say? I said, bumblebee. And it was almost like I pierced the heart, her heart, and the floodgates open. And she just sat there and these tears were just endless. They were just a flood of tears washing down on, on, on her. And I'm thinking, wow, what just happened? You know, bumblebee, bumblebee, bumblebee. You know, today I understand the significance of giving what we get. And she says, that's my dad. It's like, thank you. Thank you. That was the validation that she needed to know that her dad was with her in the spirit, from the spirit world. And I sat there looking at her thinking, well, how, how, how did all this happen? And she said to me, when my dad was alive, he was the trainer of a rugby team. And I'm still thinking, Bumblebee, Bumblebee. And she told me the name of the, um, the rugby team. And I thought their colours was orange and black. And I oh. still didn't get it. I still didn't get it because here I am thinking Bumblebee, you know, yellow and black. But she had a whole story around how her dad was a trainer and they buried him with the jersey of the rugby team, and here I am sitting there thinking the jersey, the rugby team, orange and black, that's mm -hmm. not Bumblebee, you know. Anyway, I shared the experience with my partner at the time, and he told me that many years before, the colours of their jumper was yellow, yellow and black, gold and black. 
So that was the colours of the bumblebee. I mean, I would never have known that. I mean, I would never have understood that, you know. So that was a big learning for me, you know, to get out of the way and and know that it wasn't about me and to just bring right, through right. what came through. Right. Because and you're also telling and you're also telling yeah. our listeners how it comes through for you. So like it, as a medium, you're getting these visuals, you don't always just, know these visions, what they are, but they're putting very significant evidence in your head so that the your sitter absolutely knows that this is their deceased loved one on the other side, without a doubt. Yes. There's many ways that we receive, you know, whether we see, whether we hear, whether we feel, you know, taste, smell, there's many different ways. Um, I'm actually very clairvoyant. I see very clearly. But, you know, for those listening, you know, you've got to understand as well that those in the other world, I mean, it's a miracle when you think that they can transfer energy to us. You know, it really is that they can impress images upon us or we can hear them, we can feel them, we can understand conditions. I mean, it's just, it's a miracle. It's mind boggling. So there's many different ways. So yeah, in my, in my early days, I was happy to get anything. I was happy to be able to pass on anything, you know, whereas today it's a lot more fluid for me. But it's like everything, you know, you've got to step outside to you know to grow you've got to you've got to you know be prepared to be wrong you know you've got to look fear in the face you know you've got to get egg on your face because none of what we do is about us or us looking good yeah there were some other questions there you asked I wanted to know what the spirit world is like to you and I want to know what pets experience in the afterlife well, for me, pets in the afterlife, I'll go there first. It's probably a quicker answer. To me, it, it's no different. I mean, you know, if I bring through an animal from the other world, you know, it's almost like they bring their life alive, you know. You know, they're in solid form. You know, they may show me, you know, that they're they're walking along a path, you know. The way they can impress images upon us is just, it, it's hard to comprehend. But, you know, they might show me that they're in a beautiful place, you know, whether it's the same whether, you know, I, I can tell you where those, your loved ones are walking in the other world. You know, it could be full of rainbows. It could be full of flowers. You know, there's many different ways that you can feel it and see it. You know, is it like that in the other world? When I'm reading, I know that they're impressing upon me that they're in a beautiful place. You know, I know in that moment what they're trying to pass on to me. It's no different um, for the animals. Nobody goes to the spirit world alone. I mean, this dog that just went to the spirit world, you're talking to me, jumped into a man's arm. I mean, come on, I know. They're always impressing upon me and reminding me about things to share. But nobody goes to the spirit world. Animals, humans, nobody goes alone. There's always, you know, people there to greet us, whether it's animal or, or human bird, you know, mouse, you know. You know, the amazing thing for me was in the very early days when I got into this world, I was in a seance. The medium looked at uh, one of the people there and she said, why do I see five gerbils? Five? Around gerbils. Gerbils, like those little mice or those little gerbils. Oh, okay. People get yeah. as pets. She said, I see five gerbils around your deceased husband who's coming through. And the woman said he had five gerbils as pets. And I that was the first time I realized even those gerbils had gone to the other side. I went absolutely. With them. Absolutely. The first night I publicly demonstrated in front of an audience, I had a parrot come through. Here I am standing there thinking that I was there to deliver messages from the other world. And I had this parrot and I went to this man in the audience. He'd been dragged along by his wife. And of course, he wouldn't have believed anything that happened that night other than his parrot came through and everything changed for him. So it is, it's interesting how it all works. What is it like in the other world? When I'm communicating with those in the other world, like I've said, you know, they can impress images upon us you know, if what if where they are and how I can describe that to pass on to their loved ones here on the earth. You know, I've had many different um, experiences when I've just been going to start work and I've been, oh, 
in a millimeter of a second, you know, I might have closed my eyes and I've traveled down a hallway and at the end of the hallway, there's a light and I've had a lesson and I understand there's many different rooms that we can stop in along the way before we go to the light. There's, there's many different ways to try and understand, you know, the other world. Mavis Patillo, one of my dear mentors who's now in the spirit world, she talks about worlds within worlds. And I understand that in a way of teaching to people on the earth that, you know, in the earthly world, there's many different houses in a street. And in those houses, you know, we all live different lives. And it isn't any different in the other world, you know. I believe that we take, you know, our beliefs and we can reside in, in different layers, different levels, um, you know, in the other world. I believe that we can change our life here on the earth and we can change our life in the other world and move beyond, you know, where we think, you know, we may need to stay. You know, life goes on. People in the other world are still evolving. Their life is still continuing. But my experience of going into the spirit world one night when I drifted off to sleep, you know, I asked the spirit world when I went to sleep if I could know more about their world and what it was like. And that night I had this profound experience and I woke up the next day and I was encased in this euphoricness and all the colors of the rainbow for, you know, several days. And I sat at my computer trying to understand what I experienced in the sleep state. And it was like I had total recall. And it was almost like they showed me that I was a silhouette, which is interesting when you think of a silhouette, you know, it's like, you know, no, no body, you know, like I was a silhouette and I was standing in the light. But it just broke me, um, Irene. It was the most beautiful thing that I've ever experienced. You know, we talk about the light and the other world and pure consciousness, free of form and love. It's beyond trying to describe. It's beyond, it's beyond description. Because it is. to me, all the filters, all our human filters are, are gone and you're pure and you're there and you're experiencing all of it. And another thing I want to ask you about is in your book, which I really want to talk about your book because it's wonderful. Uh, and I think so many people will learn so much from it. But you talk in your book about how we can know if our choices are coming from fear or from love. Would you like to talk to us about that? And then I have a couple of questions about your book for you. Well, I think if we're all honest, you know, we can, I think if we're all really, really honest and, and we, you know, look back, maybe it's easier for people just right now listening to, to maybe look back at a time in their life when they made a life change and they, they, they look at, you know, what was going on in their life? You know, what were they holding on to? What weren't they able to do on their own or, 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 you know, a multitude of things? And where did their choice come from? Yeah, where did their choice come from? Because, you know, when I think of um, following the vision to go to New York and when I, I mean, I'm, I just follow the pull from within, you know, I've, I've always been guided, you know, some people call it the intuition, the knowing, the voices from within. And if I didn't listen to those and follow them, I wouldn't be where I am today. So, you know, I feel that if you're able to take a leap of faith, you know, that that's the place of love. That's not the place of fear. Fear, fear holds us back. It's very limiting. Whereas you and I know and you and I have experienced the unlimitlessness from surrendering. Yeah, and and you know, in my book, I talked about my fear of horses, spending time with a beautiful horse, looking fear in the eye, um, and overcoming my fear on a human level. Learning so much from him about unconditional love, you know, and how sensitive they are, and how awake we need to be, and how present we need to be, you know, around such such beautiful, beautiful. animals. That's a wonderful yeah. story in your book about your experience with that with that horse and how that helped you so much. So I really want to ask you, because your book is very inspiring and uplifting. It's called Knowing, and it's your journey. And it's you describe in it how you blossom through love and compassion, which we're talking about as the unseen world revealed to you that love is the key to heal pain and move mountains. Talk to us about this and some of the many steps that have guided you 
to this place of eternal gratitude and peace. And what else would you like everyone to know about your book? Because I think it's a very uplifting book for people to read and and to learn more about this world. Well, I have to give James Van Prague credit for for me putting out a book because it was a, a, a very big challenge. I left school at 15. I mean, I was I was always in a dream state. School, you know, school didn't really work for me. So one of the biggest challenges for me was to write a book. And, you know, I guess if, fear, if I had been ruled by fear, um, I wouldn't have, have put the book down. I think, you know, when you're guided by those in the other world and when you know that you're not alone and when you know that there's, you know, more to this world than what any of us know, you know, through all your experiences, you've just got to keep making changes. I think if we're not making changes in our everyday life, you know, we're not living. My mum came to me from the other world and she said that to me. It's on my website. Like if we're not, you know, change is everything, you know. So if I had the mindset and the fear of, you know, I couldn't write the book, which I was stuck in, I mean, come on, what do we come here for on into the earthly world? We come here to go beyond fear. You know, we we come here to to learn about kindness. I mean, why do we come to the earth? Why do we come here? You know, what is it all about? And I think the one thing for me, you know, is right now is like facing all those things that hold us back, our challenges. And yeah, just you you cannot be ungrateful for that. I mean, for the miracles that occur in your everyday life, the support that we get along our path, you come to this place of um, gratitude. You come to this place of kindness. When you talk about compassion, James Van Prague was the person that told me that my work would be about compassion when I first met him. And he was signing one of his books that I was purchasing from him. And he put a heart on on my book. He went to put a heart. And I said, oh, I have a heart on my business card. And he said, oh, I'm not going to do the heart now. I'll put something else. And I talked to him about the work of mediums. And I mentioned to him how there was a medium out there working who was just incredible. He could dot the I's and cross the T's. And, you know, I would love to be like that. And he said, oh, but there's only one person in the world that would ever be like that. He said, you'll be known for the work of compassion. And I never understood what he was talking about. And for those listening, if you see the cover of my book, I don't know if you've realized, I recreated through a vision a very famous picture of somebody who was in the other world who was known for compassion. I'm not quite sure if you you recognize it, but I kept getting a vision from Princess Diana. And I kept seeing this vision when I was trying to do my cover. And I'm like, what are you trying to tell me? So I created that picture that she created. And then somewhere down the line, James Van Praag's words rang in my ear about the the true work and the work that I'd be known for about compassion. I mean, you know, we get a little bit lost sometimes when we try and share things. It's just so overwhelming. It's hard to comprehend how it all comes together, you know, when you just follow the, the you know, the Spirit's voice. But you cannot live in this world and not wake up giving thanks. You know, there's no better place that you would want to be or vibration that you'd want to live in in just giving thanks, not just for everything that, that that's in your life, but you know, everyone, I mean, everything, just everything, that's you know. Beautiful. That's so beautiful. And I think one of the lessons that you received, which is really worth passing along to everyone, is about being true to yourself. Would you like to comment about that and the importance of healing that you feel well, that is important for you people? Have to be, you have to be true to yourself. I think over the many years of sitting in silence and turning my attention within, you know, you, you know when you're, you're, you're lying to yourself. You know, being true to yourself, walking your path, and your path's not necessarily, you know, not everybody around you is going to be happy when you've got to leave them or you've got to, you know, follow that that pull with, yeah, you know, it can be challenging for those around you. You can be called a lot of things, selfish, whatever. (laughs) Yes. 
But, That's you know, one of the things we learn in this world is to give up judgment, right? <laughs> you did, absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, when you get the pull from within and you just go where, you know, you just go where you need to go and where you're called to go. Yeah. And it is hard for a lot of people to comprehend. What was the last question? Sorry. But that you. I know. I, I was talking about being true to yourself and the importance that we need to heal. Oh, absolutely. The healing. Well, look, when I first started the mediumship work, I would also do hands-on healing. And, you know, I was a little bit torn and spirit said to me one day, you know, for me that I didn't need to separate the two modalities, you know, that it was through the messages that came through me, through the energy and the presence, you know, that would, would, would affect people. And I get to see that. I mean, I get to see that when spirit comes in, you know, there's this power, there's this overlapping of energy and there's this power that just emanates. And through the evidence of um, memory that we're able to bring to give to their loved ones, I mean, that just pieces everything. You know, you and I were talking a little bit earlier and about the work that, you know, we all do. And, you know, for me, I see a lot of the work that I do as just planting seeds of hope. You know, if I'm able to bring through something of importance or a memory to someone in a setting and for them, you know, they leave the session and, and they go home and they think, how, how did that person know that? Or how did that person know that this is in my home? Or how do they know about the passing day? You know. And they, I get to see it. People come back to me. They email me. They tell me. You know, they start to think that there's got to be so much more than what they understand when they've lost a loved one. Because it isn't until a lot of people lose a loved one that this opens up for them. But, you know, then they start um, reading books. They start having their own experiences. You know what it's like. And there's a rippled effect that happens, just changing the consciousness. Changing the consciousness is wonderful. Well, let's talk about changing consciousness with all the things that you do that, to help people. So I know that you do private mediumship readings. You have private psychic readings. You have group readings. You have a mentoring program. You have a seeing beyond program. So tell us all about that. And I really think, and you also have a special offer for our members today. So would you like to tell everyone all the ways that they can help themselves, help themselves through <laughs> Marilyn and through your gifts? Help themselves. <laughs> well, I think showing up's a big thing, you know, showing up's a big thing. Yeah. Really trusting, you know, the, you know, their inner voice and, and being guided. I mean, going to my website, your your podcast, you know, what you do is just wonderful. You know, I've done Facebook lives, I've done podcasts and you know, we do it because for me, you know, there may be somebody going through a difficult, challenging time at it's three o'clock in the morning and they feel alone, but hey, they've got a computer and they log on and they see one of your podcasts, something resonates. And through that, the healing occurs for them and they get to know they're not alone. So, you know, thank you for the work that you do, the tireless work that you do. No, thank you. Because, you know, that's that's why we do what we do. You know, we know that there are people grieving. We know that there are people suffering. We know that people are alone, but we want them to know that they're not alone. Yeah, you know, nobody walks alone. Um, oh, the classes, they're all on my website. You know, so if Mar I can reach out for you if they want a private mediumship reading. They can do a private reading and there's a we're going to offer a coupon. Anybody listening, they can use the word unfoldment on my reading site. So if they wanted a mediumship reading, there's a coupon space and they type in unfoldment. It's a hundred dollars off. Um I'm not sure of the American conversion at the moment, but it's a put it's a link in. We'll put a link in. Yeah. It's a very it's it's a very a very affordable um session that I wanted to offer people who, you know, find me through you. Yeah, I take many classes. I teach a lot these days. I, I love teaching. I love seeing other people experience and unfold and develop. So I spend a lot of my time teaching. I have a lot of group classes, whether it's seeing beyond, whether it's, um, you know, take your mediumship to greater heights. I also have a beginner's guide to spiritual development, whether it's five weeks. I have allow me to be your personal guide. 
you know, I tailor my events to people who come to me. I love um, mindfulness. I love meditation. I just love helping people, you know, get out of what they're in as well. You know, you talk about the healing part of it. There's many different ways that we can help people heal, you know, through anxiety, you know, their, their, their mind, their, their mind clutter, their mind attacks. You know, it's just great. It's great you to be able to. To do that, right? And you know what I perceive with you is that anyone who seeks you out is going to a place of total acceptance and love, and there is no judgment at all, and you are going to kind of hone in on what they need and who they are and work with them, which is such a beautiful offering. Uplift them. Uplift their soul. The true work, Mavis Petula's words, the true work of mediumship is the upliftment of the soul. And we can do it in many different ways. You know, you talk about fear and love. If you're not walking in a place of fear on the street and someone passes you, no judgment, and you smile, you know, they mightn't answer you, but you know from the look in their eye that they've been deeply touched. You know, you know that they will go home and they'll hold that moment in their heart, especially if they're very lonely and they don't have anybody. It's, you know, just the importance of being present and being available. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. And we will give all these links so people will be able to get onto your site and uh, seek you out for all that you can do for them. And I would like to know the Marilyn Wall's personal tip for finding joy in life. (laughs) Honor thyself. Oh, that's a beauty. That's That's just what I heard. Honor thyself. Um, Yeah, don't walk. Don't live someone else's life. Honor thyself. That's yeah. beautiful, Marilyn. You know, Marilyn, in closing, I would like to share this very meaningful quote from your book, Knowing, with our Grief and Rebirth podcast audience. We all know people who look out the window and imagine a beautiful garden while others see only the weeds. We can look at our own lives the same way. Do we see? The amazing potential we hold within, or are we too fearful to step into the life we are truly born to live? The choice is ours. We have free will. One thing is for sure. The years will pass. Our time in the physical body will end, and we can either have poured our hearts into becoming all that we can be, or we can still just be looking at the weeds. Absolutely. How beautiful and how so very wise. I want to thank you from my heart for being the brilliant light for the spirit world that you are. And thank you from my heart for bringing your brilliant light to this illuminating interview on Grief and Rebirth podcast. Thank Thank you you. so much, Marilyn. And here is, thank you. And here is my loving reminder everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com and make sure to follow us and like us on social at at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued. Thank you again, Marilyn. Many, many blessings and bye for now. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.